um, I was uh, talking with the organizers and learning that um, this conference uh, is uh, quite large and there's many participants. Um, I am very excited to see AI um, be so prominent and to have uh, Beijing as a, as a center uh, for a lot of uh, AI uh, participants. I was in Beijing in June of last year to start a new joint program on communication data science, uh, joint between Xinhua University and the University of Southern California. So I have many fond memories and many new colleagues uh, in Beijing. Uh, I was there for a week and I am very sorry that I cannot be there in person, but I hope to be able to come to the conference in the future. Um, I, I want to talk today about um, something that I call thoughtful artificial intelligence. And by that, I mean um, AI that can really reason and think about the steps and the processes that it is undertaking uh, so that it can communicate its thoughts, so that it can improve its thinking, so that it can uh, include new aspects of thinking and learn new ways to think about problems. And I think it's a great way to look at how AI systems can be partners uh, for data science, for scientific research. And I'm very hopeful that over the next uh, couple of decades, we will see uh, an emergence of AI scientists that will be partnering uh, with uh, data scientists in industry, but also with scientific researchers in different science disciplines. Um, as you know, I highlight here uh, pieces of AI that have come of age. I have examples that point to uh, machine learning systems, uh, robotics, uh, things like recommender systems, um, uh, self-driving cars, robots that play soccer, um, IBM Watson that did a uh, play a game of question and answering uh, and won against the best human, um, knowledge graphs that help improve search and also conversational AI systems. And it, when I look at this landscape of uh, successes for AI, I want to highlight that I see these two different threads that are very complementary and interacting. Uh, one is what I might call a data thread that's very much ingrained in learning from a lot of data and a lot of observations. Uh, that's what I see at the top. And at the bottom with Watson, with the knowledge graphs, with the conversational systems, I see what I call a knowledge thread to distinguish it because it is really using knowledge about the world, knowledge about um, interesting entities, knowledge about tasks in the case of Siri. So all of this knowledge is very powerful to uh, enable also AI applications. And when I look at AI in science, which is my main interest of my research, I see that these uh, types of technologies have also reached science. So for example, the technology that we use for recommender systems uh, is very powerful when we look at climate data or uh, self-driving ro robots at the bottom of the ocean conducting experiments and gathering data. Uh, robot automation that automates laboratories um, uh, in uh, biology and chemistry. Um, and at the bottom, I see a lot of work in text extraction in science, knowledge graphs, open facts is a great project where uh, a lot of uh, different entities of interest were integrated for pharmaceutical companies and also problem solving and understanding the workflows of science. So I see that AI in science cuts across both, both traditions. Uh, AI has a long history on both this data thread and the knowledge thread that I distinguished, a long history, both in uh, the data analysis side and also on the knowledge and reasoning side. So pioneers in AI like Herb Simon, and uh, Ed Feigenbaum, Bruce Buchanan, and others uh, really looked at both sides um, of, of uh, different approaches to look at science from an AI perspective. 
And I'll give some examples of both um, in, in something that um, the, the magazine Science called AI Transforming Science. So on the top, you see from the data thread, uh, work on computational sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, using machine learning and um, constraint optimization techniques to uh, study uh, the natural environment. At the top right, um, also deep learning to improve uh, protein structure uh, prediction. And uh, at the bottom left, you see an example from the knowledge uh, tradition or the knowledge threads in AI on using um, knowledge graphs and inference to uh, drive with knowledge discovery in um, toxicology. Uh, and then at the bottom right, also learning from text about word embeddings that capture latent knowledge in the, in the literature. So I see that AI is penetrating science in all of these respects. And my talk really has these four uh, pieces or four steps as an outline. One is that uh, knowledge technologies are increasingly important. Uh, so as important as data and machine learning is, I think that using knowledge for science is increasingly important. Um, AI offers a more systematic, correct, and unbiased approach to science um, in addition to rigorous reporting. So we can actually uh, develop AI systems that are a lot more um, uh, rigorous in terms of scientific research. The third one is that AI will excel at assembling very diverse, fragmented knowledge to study inter interdisciplinary questions. And then finally, I will talk about thoughtful AI and how we use knowledge to uh, create effective AI scientists that can partner with human researchers. And everything that I mentioned in my talk um, is very focused on scientific research, but really scientists deal with data. And so many of these points apply to uh, data science in general as well. So let me go through each of these points and um, uh, try to convince you uh, of, of my thinking. Uh, knowledge technologies are increasingly important. So I see this on the one hand through the massive adoption in industry of uh, very large scale knowledge bases um, that capture different kinds of knowledge that are relevant for different purposes and applications. So this is very powerful. And I think that Wikidata remains an open um, knowledge base that is a very substantial knowledge graph that is open uh, knowledge that is actually having quite an impact in science. But I see that more and more uh, there's industry scale knowledge graphs and knowledge bases being used throughout. I also see that in natural language, the last uh, three or four years, there's more and more interest in extracting common sense from text, uh, common sense knowledge from text. Uh, we do a lot of work in my institute in this area, a lot of interest in adversarial examples where perhaps with some uh, additional knowledge one could overcome some of the adversarial uh, learning problems. Uh, I also see that there's a lot more interest in computer vision. So this is a very old example from the Visual Genome Project, but there's many others where uh, extracting knowledge, captions, ways to describe photographs, videos uh, is becoming more and more uh, prevalent and being able to create um, uh, explicit representations of the objects and the relationships that we can observe. Uh, and then finally, machine learning and data science, uh, more and more interest on explaining what the systems are doing uh, using knowledge and terms that a user would understand. Um, and also a very interesting direction on theory guided data science where uh, we use physics knowledge, we use knowledge about the physical world to constrain what a machine learning system is learning uh, so that it satisfies and respects those laws of physics or these existing theories about a domain. So I see more and more interest in knowledge technologies all throughout uh, and across. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in terms of uh, 
capturing knowledge and keeping it up to date. So this is um, a page where uh, they, they record an, an estimate of how much knowledge is contained in Wikipedia. And so the English version of Wikipedia in October 2019 had 5 million articles. Um, and so they, they estimate that in order to describe uh, notable entities in the world that should be recognized in an encyclopedia, there should be about 104 uh, million articles. And so this is quite an incredible task to expand a resource like this and keeping it up to date at such scales. Um, so it's very humbling to think about uh, trying to capture knowledge relevant to a domain or having knowledge about entities of interest in general. Um, so it's a big challenge for us to capture all this knowledge. Um, however, uh, there's a lot of utility to having uh, resources like Wikipedia or like Wikidata capturing a lot of knowledge. And certainly in science, we have the same situation. So I see continuous interest in, in knowledge technologies. My second point is that I think that AI offers a very unique approach to look at uh, data and knowledge um, in any domain. And I want to talk a little bit about um, how uh, when humans do uh, research and use data, uh, they have uh, a number of faults. So let me get into this. So, so when we talk about human researchers, and I am a human researcher, um, we are uh, subject to um, errors, mistakes, uh, etc. So I'll give you some examples here. One is that we are not necessarily systematic. So there's a study uh, that I cite here uh, where they use a text extraction system to uh, compile everything that was known from the fossil record. And they compared what the automated AI system had extracted with a manual labor that took about 10 years, several people, uh, to extract manually from the literature. And it turns out that the AI system was a lot more systematic and a lot more thorough, even though text extraction is still not a perfect technology, um, but it did look through a lot more um, in, in terms of uh, really extracting items from the papers that the humans had missed. So just because it was a manual um, type of work uh, that humans did doesn't make it uh, better than what an imperfect AI system was doing. Um, another example is that humans make errors. So I cite a piece of work where the authors had compiled information about the economic um, recession in, in different countries and actually left some countries out. So there was a student that couldn't reproduce the work and through some inter interactions, they found that in fact, the paper had serious errors. Um, and so sometimes, you know, accidentally, uh, important information can be left out of, of analysis. I also cite a study that illustrates that humans may be biased. So this is, uh, I cite an AI system that looked through the paleoclimate record, looked at data from past climates over many centuries, and proposed some hypotheses that could explain the trends in climate. Um, some of them were never mentioned in papers from the scientists that were looking at the same data. And when asked, the scientists uh, simply said, yeah, um, that's a good hypothesis. I just didn't uh, think of mentioning it. I, I just thought that the ones that I discussed in the paper were good enough. And so there's a certain um, way in which we uh, lay out possibilities and, and explore them and they're not without bias sometimes. And then finally, humans actually uh, write papers in a way that leaves out many important information, lots of important information. And so uh, I call it poor reporting, but it's really writing papers that are very, very hard to reproduce and replicate. And we've done some studies quantifying the amount of effort that it takes to replicate papers. And so I think that if you look at this picture and you look at 
science as a whole and the science legacy of publications that um, think about AI systems that could do some of these uh, data analysis, that could do some of these studies, that could suggest some possible interpretations and hypotheses in a much more systematic, correct, unbiased way, and to be able to do a rigorous reporting of actually what the AI system did. So to me, AI systems can really be a game changer in terms of keeping science a lot more rigorous. Um, I think we are far from having AI systems that can be very creative, uh, that can um, cause paradigm shifts in science, that can uh, design very new methods and approaches. But I think that there's a lot of science that AI systems could um, scope out and address um, in, a, in a better way. Um, so to give you an example, um, uh, this is from work that we did on proteomics and, and genomics. Um, so we have an AI system that automatically, uh, you give it a hypothesis and automatically um, uh, looks through what kind of data and what kind of methods it can use uh, to test that hypothesis. And so in doing that, uh, it gets results it reasons about the results and then uh, generates a revised hypothesis if appropriate, uh, together with some confidence value for that hypothesis. So, so what we found is that most papers um, in this area, this is cancer omics, cancer proteomics, um, used a particular search engine or a particular method or implementation and uh, did not explore other possibilities, did not look at ensemble methods. It's hard enough to run one method, um, uh, in, in this case, a protein search engine uh, and peptide search engine. So, um, so it's, it's hard uh, for uh, human analysis to really be thorough in, in this respect. So AI systems can really try every search engine, check every possible option, and do a better job at the search and optimization aspects of science. So, so I have this picture here to kind of um, help us look at ourselves in the mirror and really think that, you know, if, if we consider uh, machines to be able to carry out instructions, if we give machines the instructions of science, uh, they could do a much more thorough and correct um, uh, job at um, analyzing a lot of the data that we have available. So I spend a lot of time uh, reading papers and books that describe how scientists uh, pose questions, how they approach answering those questions, and what kinds of cognitive mechanisms we could have in, in an AI scientist to really uh, design um, a, a thoughtful system that goes through the motions of what it means to do science and do it uh, thoroughly. The third point that I want to uh, visit is that um, I believe that AI will make a huge difference, not, that, not just on analyzing data for a specific discipline, but I think it will make a huge difference in terms of questions and, and um, scientific research where the knowledge is very fragmented and the systems are complex and we need to pursue interdisciplinary work. This is very challenging for people. Uh, so if I think about understanding the brain or a complex system like our brain or understanding uh, ecosystems and, our, and the health of our planet, understanding um, the, the history of, of the universe, I really see that uh, in order to integrate all of the diverse knowledge and data will really require us to take AI very seriously. So I, I give this as, as a um, um, setup where, you know, um, years ago, a century ago, you could see, and, and before that, for, since Galileo, you could see scientists authoring one single paper. Uh, as single authors, and they would think about that book or that paper for a long time. Um, then, you know, early in the 20th century, we started to see co-authorship 
and uh, very simple co-authorship networks. And then that led to larger and larger groups. So there's a picture, that third picture is the Human Genome Project, uh, which had many different connections and, and uh, hundreds of people participating uh, to the one on the very right, which is for the ATLAS experiment. Um, and so uh, if you are really uh, doing major discoveries, I think their article had about 4,000 authors in, in particle physics. Um, so, so I think that we have to think that science is becoming this much more complex and how can AI help us handle that? So this is a picture from proteomics, uh, from our colleagues in proteomics, and every color depicts an area where different proteomics labs have different concentration of expertise. There's no lab that has expertise across all of them, or very few really, um, but each um, box uh, shows different methods. And that, you know, there's no lab that is familiar and expert in all of the methods. They, they basically know certain uh, paths through the circle um, that they use to, to um, explore and address. So, so both on the experimental side on the right and then on the computational side on the left, uh, there's many options and many areas of expertise that if you uh, consider a single proteomics lab, not everybody has. And I think this applies across all areas of research. I think of AI, you know, there's no lab that has expertise in the very wide range of AI topics that we have uh, today. So, so this is a, a survey uh, that was done in 2011. I think the case is worse uh, even today where scientists that review for science, so you could consider them the elite of, of uh, scientists, um, they were asked if they have the expertise in their group to do the analysis that they needed. And uh, the majority said that they need to collaborate or they are not able to analyze their data. So, um, so I think that it's a missed opportunity uh, when we don't have better ways to integrate um, data sets together. So I think that AI systems can really partner with humans in terms of helping us assemble fragmented knowledge and um, pursue this interdisciplinary uh, science. Um, I want to give an example from a project that we are working on uh, where we're doing um, integration of models from different disciplines. So if we want to understand uh, uh, food availability or food shortages or fisheries, a lot of things depend on climate, they depend on um, uh, water models, they depend on agriculture models, economic prices for the crops. Um, there's many different aspects to the problem. And the models in each of these disciplines are very, very different. So for example, at the bottom left, I show a physics-based model for hydrology uh, that you know, looks at, uh, it's basically a lot of physics equations that help us understand the, the path of water through, through a certain channel, a certain, um, uh, basin. And then on the bottom center is a cartoon of, a, of an agent-based uh, social model that tells us how many agents go through what kinds of patterns of behavior or, or outcomes. And so when we want to integrate these methods together, will the farmers plant more if the cost of the crops are higher and then there will be more water consumption and more irrigation and therefore less water reserves in the aquifers. And if the climate is this way, then that will have consequences down in a few years. It takes months or years to put together integrated models, even modest ones. And uh, they're very much done by hand and they are in increased demand. Um, they are very different in nature, in, in nature. So from the questions that they answer to the way that uh, the models are set up, uh, the variables that they take into account, the kind of data that they use, um, and how the models are run. So we're using AI to bridge 
across these different disciplines. So uh, just to give you an idea, we take every model and we represent the processes around, the, and around how the model is used. So uh, how is the data prepared? What kinds of uh, data does it need from other models? Uh, what parameters are possible to explore? What kind of physical variables we can study with this model, et cetera. And so we're using AI to make the process of assembling these complex integrated models in science um, more efficient, uh, hopefully. So this is an ongoing project that uh, is very exciting. And uh, in, in integrating these models, it can help us study the, the causality across a region. Um, if, if the uh, uh, if the farmers plant less, then what are the implications for water, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, uh, you know, to summarize, when uh, the problems that we face are highly interdisciplinary and knowledge is very fragmented in different labs, in different uh, groups in different universities, in different schools, it's harder for us to, to integrate them together. And I think AI systems can play a bigger role. So within a discipline, um, that picture that I show at the bottom left of, you know, let's see how humans really uh, do science and do it better uh, within a discipline or within a lab. But then those kinds of um, benefits uh, get amplified when you do interdisciplinary science. The, the final part of my talk is to think about um, uh, research directions for AI that will really make a difference uh, in terms of these AI systems partnering with humans. So we talk about human AI collaboration, uh, human AI uh, partnerships. I think that there's a certain uh, more stringent set of requirements that come from uh, having a partner in, in science because scientists really want to understand and they want explanations, they want uh, to critique, they want debate uh, about the questions. And so, um, so I think that's uh, very important. And I want to point out that um, one of the most important parts of uh, being able to uh, interact between computers and humans comes from what are the strengths of each. And I'm sure that you've come across this idea that humans are better at some tasks, computers are better at other tasks. I use this example from freestyle chess. So this is a style of chess that Gary Kasparov proposed. Um, some years ago where he said, well, a player can be any combination of humans and computers, uh, any supercomputers, any, any number of humans, that would be one player, a whole team of computers and humans competing against another player. So how can we design the best players that combine humans and computers? And to me, it was very, very telling that it was not teams that had the best combinations of the best computers and the um, most advanced grandmasters, but actually even uh, humans that had moderate knowledge about chess, if they had a good process, if they knew what, which human should make which uh, plays, which computer program should they use to make which plays. So if they had a good process for who would be responsible for what, uh, the overall player was much better. So I think that this is a huge lesson for us to, to learn and to devise. You know, it's not, you know, let's use the best human and the best computer and the most advanced algorithm, but that sometimes the interaction and the complementarity between them uh, produces the best result. And that was the case with, with chess. I find this really remarkable and very interesting. So, um, so I go back to this picture what would it take to, to have science uh, um, partners in AI systems? What would AI systems need to do to help us solve these big problems? So I um, uh, wrote a paper recently where I laid out uh, seven principles of what I call thoughtful AI systems uh, that can really 
uh, have this partnership with humans um, for, for scientific research and for data science. So I'll go through each of them in turn uh, in a little bit of detail, just to give you an idea um, of what I mean by this. And um, there's, there's a paper to go with it if you're interested to learn more. So the first principle is that these thoughtful AI systems uh, need to be rational, need to have some knowledge that determines their behavior. And uh, this implies that they have to be a bit predictable. So uh, you have to be able to understand or characterize how that system is going to behave. And so I give examples here of some of the knowledge structures that we use in our work. Uh, I'm sure there's many more. Um, I think of knowledge very, very broadly. So even, um, you know, any, any numerical representations can also represent knowledge. Um, but I think that having uh, these AI scientists um, use knowledge that you can link to specific behavior is very important so that we can answer questions such as, does this AI system know about, you know, whatever theories of water flow or anything else and be able to determine yes or no, it, it knows about it. Uh, the second principle is what I call context. So uh, today's AI systems in science, at least, they're giving a task and they don't know what the task is or what the task means or how two tasks that they are given compare. So they're giving some data set, some algorithm, some metric, and off you go. And so I think that it's very important that AI systems start to have um, an idea of what kinds of questions they're trying to answer, how they might be related, what's the purpose of that question and what's the significance of that question. And so we're starting to um, chart out uh, what kinds of questions we can ask in science, what kinds of patterns those questions follow, uh, what are the methods that are followed in different disciplines and start to think about the processes that are followed by scientists to answer different kinds of questions and what kind of data would they seek or what kind of method would they follow. But the questions are very, very important and not just the question, but how the question came about. In many cases, the AI system should negotiate the question, right? You ask me this, I don't know how to answer that because there's no data for this particular case, but maybe if I look at a related question, that would be informative and so on. Uh, the third principle is initiative. So I think that to have an AI scientist that is your colleague that is helping you uh, look at a very uh, complex question, you don't want to have to teach them everything and to explain to them everything. And so they need to be very self-driven in terms of learning. And they can't just scrape all their knowledge every night, read the literature from scratch and then uh, reconstruct everything they know. They have to be able to judge, you know, I have these 10 new papers that came out yesterday, this is how I would integrate what I'm learning from those papers into what I know and be able to apply some judgment to um, how to integrate all of this knowledge into the way that the system is working. Um, I also think that uh, in many cases, if I have a question, it might be that I have to answer it myself just through some self-directed study or inquiry. And so these um, AI systems should be able to do this. So I use an example here from, from DISC. It's a, I mentioned this earlier, where we give the system a hypothesis and it runs through all the uh, all these uh, processes about what data do I need, what uh, methods can I use, but I wish that this system refreshed its own knowledge when new proteomic methods come about, better search engines come about for protein search and so on and so forth, so that it would refresh its, its knowledge automatically. And I think that a lot of our AI systems become obsolete very quickly. Um, the next principle is the network principle. So I think uh, our AI system should live 
in an ecosystem of web resources, uh, a knowledge web of scientific resources where they can access services, they can access um, databases, they can access methods, they can access knowledge of different kinds, uh, libraries of workflows or methods, all kinds of different knowledge uh, so that they can um, answer uh, the questions that arise. And so without having this connectivity and uh, being able to ingest, but also output their results into this network of the scientific record. I think that's very important um, to be able to relate to other things. Um, the next principle is the articulation principle. So uh, today uh, we hear a lot about the importance of explanation for AI systems. I think in science, this is a necessity because scientists always want to hear not just the explanation about how you reach the conclusion, but how that finding relates to what is known in the literature. And so uh, that's a explanation is very central to science. But what I'm saying here is going even further, which is that um, these AI systems should be able to articulate um, and communicate their findings to different audiences. So if you think about it, a scientist can answer questions from people that come to their work from different perspectives or different disciplines and answer those questions in a way that connects to what that other researcher already knows. And I think in addition to being able to answer questions from different um, backgrounds, uh, they should be able to respond to those questions, but also discuss and also ask follow-up questions like, well, why were you curious about this? Or why did you want to know about this? And so that's a way also for, for an AI scientist to understand the context of their own findings and the importance of their own findings and how to contrast and integrate with other work. Um, I think there's also an ethical principle that is important. And what I mean by this is actually quite uh, broad in terms of ethics. So um, my main concern would be with an AI scientist that its behavior and its, um, its uh, results would convey their scope and their limitation. So to say, you know, um, this is what I believe, but of course I'm not an expert in X, uh, it's a very important qualification of anyone's scope and limitation. So to say, you know, I believe that this is true, but of course I only have access to this type of data or this particular type of perspective, I think is very important, particularly in science. So, so putting knowledge in, into perspective is very important. And finally, this is the final principle. I call it a systems principle. I think this is a huge, um, you know, the seventh huge research area for AI systems, which is that we create uh, systems for particular tasks or purposes. Sometimes we train systems to work across several tasks uh, and we see how effective that is. Um, but we have a lot to do in terms of composing, uh, you know, treating AI systems as systems that should be able to be composed or that do uh, things at different levels of abstraction. So connecting different AI capabilities is very important. So when I think about an AI scientist, it should be able to explain, it should be able to propose, it should be able to design, it should be able to plan. There's many, many capabilities that they should have. And uh, it's quite, quite uh, important that we are able to um, uh, integrate them together. Uh, so this is a summary of these seven principles. I think that these are uh, very important areas of research in AI. I think they will benefit uh, um, pushing AI towards being effective partners for science, uh, for AI systems. Um, but I think that they will be generally applicable uh, much more broadly. Um, so I want to conclude by uh, running through the main ideas of the talk. Um, I started talking about how I believe knowledge technologies are increasingly more important and certainly I see them more and more mentioned and emphasized even in uh, the most data-driven circles in AI and, and data science. 
Um, I also think that AI systems can offer a more systematic, correct, unbiased approach to analyzing data, to doing science, and to do rigorous reporting. So we are working on systems to automate time series analysis, to automate uh, classification, and so on. There's an entire emerging area of automating machine learning. So I think AI systems can really be a lot more systematic, uh, and not just at data analysis, but at hypothesis generation and, and other aspects of, of um, uh, science. Um, third, that I think AI will be particularly effective when we face interdisciplinary frontiers. And then uh, my last point and the last few things that I've been talking about is how to design thoughtful AI systems that will really be effective partners uh, to help us um, analyze the amounts of data, information, and knowledge uh, that is available to us about, uh, about the world. And uh, that concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take questions. OK. Uh, thank you, Professor Gill, for the insightful talk, especially the principles for thoughtful artificial intelligence. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. I noticed that uh, we have one audience uh, should be Yan Jun. Yeah, so enable you to speak. Yan Jun, please, you have a question, right? Okay, yeah, maybe first ask, uh, ask one question from the audience. Um, one professor asked, emotion is an important factor in human intelligence. So do you think uh, whether it is possible to consider emotion in thought for AI, maybe consider as one principle? Yes, I think that's a very interesting point. And in fact, um, I think that, uh, you know, the way I gave the talk, I talk about humans being biased, for example. But in some sense, I think there's one emotion that's very important in science, which is stubbornness. So this sense of determination and stubbornness, you know, I really think that there's something there. Uh, so to me, that's, you know, perhaps the most important emotion um, that, that we should include into these systems. But, but for general intelligence, I think uh, uh, the, the question is very much on, on target. And we have um, a group of researchers at USC that have developed um, emotion-driven architectures, and uh, they are extremely important to develop virtual humans, uh, particularly in the medical field, so. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Yanjun, please. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I, um, I want to know uh, whether the professor um, can expand uh, such issues that many persons are, uh, are focused on it. Um, uh, they argue that uh, currently uh, the technology of neural networks uh, is not very uh, robust and not very safe. Uh, I wonder whether the uh, explainable AI can um, give some um, give some point to make the uh, AI be more robust and be safe in uh, uh, some um, application area. For example, autonomous vehicle. Will uh, will it be the uh, future um, research directions? And uh, thanks. Thank you. That's a great question. I think that um, uh, you know almost any artificial artifact. Um, has a certain purpose and scope and function, right? So if you were to buy a, a rice cooker, uh, there's you know some that have more buttons than others. Or if you were to design a bridge, some have are more appropriate technologies for a larger uh, span than others. So I think with AI, uh, there's different technologies that have different um, purposes or different functions or different strengths. And I think we have so much work to do to understand 
the, the methodology to design AI systems for particular purposes. So, so as you said, explanation is incredibly important, um, but I also think that uh, neural networks give us such a powerful substrate to do very robust uh, learning for important uh, and crucial tasks. Uh, what we don't know how to do is how to supplement that or complement that with these more thoughtful AI that I am uh, mentioning. So when I see work on uh, theory-driven machine learning or physics-driven machine learning, I get very excited because I see that knowledge is meeting data at the learning algorithm level. So I think that there's uh, a lot of work that we need to do to, to uh, link and connect uh, these different approaches and paradigms in the context of different applications and different purposes. Okay, uh, Professor Gia, thank you very much. Actually, we still have some questions, but because of time limitation, we will forward the question to you later. Thank you very okay. much for the great okay. talk. Mm. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.